Well, you wouldn't believe who just dropped in, Chad Bart, Gary Pickens, and they're going to talk a little bit and bring their experience to the table and teach us a little bit about bugling, what the external call the little bighorn and the tormentor can do and some of their techniques that they've learned. And we're actually going to do some videos uh, in this month and next month pre-season and a little bit of demonstrations and some of the years of experience that we've all had. So who has to start? Gary, you're prettier. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, I should have taken time to put makeup on. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, where to start? Um, going into the season, one of the biggest mistakes people make is not listening to the elk. I can't stress that enough. If they're bugling, listen to them, return the same kind of a bugle. If you're out there in the first couple of weeks doing big, you know, fighting bulls, they're not going to come in. They're not up to that yet. So what I tend to stick with is more cow calling, smaller spike, you know, grunts and squeals. Uh, if I got a bull that's interested, I'll do a lot of cow calls and then I'll do a spike squeal and those bulls really want to come in and kick that spike's butt and take those cows away from him. So that's starters for me what about you Chad? Um, I start uh, it, it's kind of like elevates throughout elk season um, but I kind of tend to use the same thing but just with more intensity as the season goes uh, especially if you're in some of the areas that we like to hunt that are a little bit further away uh, from the roads a um, little bit less pressure um, I find that more than likely you have an older cow population and that older cow population will start to cycle uh, about the time uh, that archery season starts. Um, that's why you always hear these people starting to talk, you know, uh, geez, I was out opening weekend, I didn't hear anything, it's too hot. Uh, but then you hear some other individuals saying, oh God, the bulls are screaming already. Uh, more than likely that's contributed to the age of the elk population in the area that you're hunting. Um, so with that being said, um, I start to like to get into the huffs and the grunts, uh, start to get aggressive on the cow calls, uh, especially like some older cow calls uh, with some lost cows. Uh, even go back and I even use the hoochie mama along with my uh, my external cow calls uh, to throw in the calf call. Uh, I like to throw in some excitement like a bull has actually hooked uh, one of those hot cows from the herd already. Um, that's why I like to get into the huffs and the grunts. Uh, start to get a little bit more aggressive and I'm, I'm trying to portray more instead of calling to a bull or a cow to bring them in um, I'm actually trying to portray that I'm calling to the cow that, you know, you're going to stay with me. Um, you're not going anywhere, you're hot, and um, we're going to have our fun, <laughs> basically, is what it boils down to. So I like to do a lot of huffs and grunts. I probably get a little bit more aggressive than most right off the, the bat. But if I'm hunting in an area where it has a, a younger cow population, uh, Gary hit the nail on the head, you know, about calling along with what the bull's reactions are. Uh, but a lot of times if you do get into a herd, um, you'll hear those cows starting to get a little agitated even on opening weekend. And you'll hear the huffs and the grunts from those bulls. It won't be that locator call, you know, the long whiny sound. Right. Um, it'll be more of the chuckles. Um, Dan and I had a situation, I think we were, what, second week of the season. Uh, we got into an area where there wasn't a whole lot going on right off the bat. Uh, we did start to see some cows, started hearing the, the cow talk. Uh, we got into the huffs and the grunts. Um, Dan started with the chuckling, and that bull came out, and he did 21 chuckles in a row. Uh, totally amazing, but what that bull, that bull was mad because another bull had moved in with those cows. We actually intercepted the group, um, and I firmly believe that that's what that cow was doing is that chuckling. And the huffs and grunts um, was pretty much telling that cow, you're mine, you come back here, don't, don't go to that other bull. Um, so that was early on in the season before they started to rub, but I think a lot of that had to do with less pressure, um, older cow populations, and that's kind of the theory that I go by. Um, so Gary hit the nail on the head, um, you know, with the calling as the bull does, but I really believe that that mixture, you have to read what they're saying. Um, you have to know what's going on, and they'll tell you, even how old the cows are in the herd uh, okay. when you when you get in on them. Okay, very good. Now Gary sells a diaphragm call. 
from my elk call. <clears throat> you can make your own diaphragm calls for about buck seventy-five a piece. Takes you maybe five minutes to make it. Uh, we sponsor a couple of youth groups back in the Midwest for turkey calling. Uh, they'll bring all these youth in and make them all turkey calls uh, with our kits and show the children how to use the turkey calls to call in turkeys. And then we end up getting nasty grams from parents. They had to sit in the car for an hour listening to the <laughs> kids squeak on a diaphragm all the way back home. But nice. then again, we're here to make them better hunters and they understand you know, what's going on. So uh, simplicity. Um, I came up with this when I was guiding in the backcountry. I had a dozen brand new calls that were bad. I went o'clock in the morning with a gas lantern dissecting them, trying to put them back together. And that started the thinking process of, why isn't there something available to where I can make diaphragm calls in the remote places out in the wilderness and uh, be able to take care of my clients? So uh, we've been doing this since 2002 and uh, going strong and growing every year. And uh, so myelkcall.com is the uh, there. Uh, this year, unfortunately, we are limited on elk estrus. Uh, we have pretty much sold out. We have uh, clients from last year that already... Uh, have taken uh, what we the amount that we got a lot of in Idaho uh, they passed a law to where you cannot use the urine from moose, deer, elk, and antelope and uh, so that cut down a lot of the suppliers they got out of the business but uh, we do have a secret weapon that uh, we use uh, in our uh, cover spray that, that's really good um, pre-season uh, people, I can't tell you enough to get out there and hike the mountains, look at topo maps. I've even gone to the, the cost of, of hiring an airplane at $65 an hour to fly over areas that I want to hunt, to, to look at the landscape, to take photographs, to have documentation. Then I go into the area to scout it and I'll have my photographs with my topo map so I know where I'm at at all times. And, you know, if we happen to see elk when we're in the airplane, hey, we know where they're at. But do your due diligence and do your, your scouting and, and uh, preseason workout, get in shape. Uh, in, the, in the West, we're in mountains. We're not just walking to a tree stand. Um, it gets it's pretty grueling at times. But yes, there are areas that uh, are pretty easy walking and uh, you know, elk are where you find them. Very good. Uh, did you want to blow on that uh, diaphragm oh, call? Okay. This is his. Very good. Dollar seventy five works as good as a <laughs> yes. <laughs> and well, Chad has been experimenting with the little bighorn, and he picked it up what last night. Yes. And you, I think you might have tried it one, couple times maybe before then. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and then tell us the story. All right, so I'm kind of a dyed-in-the-wool, you know, diaphragm, baseball bat kind of guy. I've been using it for 20 years. Called a lot of elk in, a lot of bulls. We've killed a lot of bulls. And as Dan knows, um, Dan's a great inventor. He makes great products. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that when I find something that works, you can't really get me to move off of it. It's true. Uh, it took me a while to, uh, to use the idea of the peepit. Um, I was even skeptical in the beginning. I had to make sure I marked my strings with uh, a magic marker to make sure that they didn't move. Um, so we're going on several different versions of the peepit. I even have one of the originals in my original bow, um, and that hasn't moved yet. So um, I know Dan's been making these calls. He's called bulls in for me with his calls. Um, but it really, I was really, you know, set in the diaphragm and the bugle. Well, yesterday I was doing a lot of cleaning around the house and Dan was nice enough to give me a call. And uh, before I picked up my entire mess in my house, I decided to sit down in the middle of the mess and uh, start playing around with this call. And I was actually totally amazed um, with the capabilities of this external call. Uh, one of the things I like to do, especially when the heat of the battle with a big bull, so I start like to throw in some lip balls, uh, sound like I'm a little bigger in certain situations. 
Um, at first, that's one of the things that I was not able to do with Dan's call. Uh, so I, would, I sat there and I thought, I'm going to figure this lip ball out uh, with the call. And I am totally amazed that there's actually a product on the market uh, that's an external call that I'm able to lip ball with. And it sounds so realistic. Oh, we were, it's wicked. Yeah, we were... We were practicing against real bulls um, on the computer, and I'm really, really excited to see, um, you know, what this actually produces. Um, I might kind of mess up a little bit here um, on the call. As I said, I just figured this out yesterday, uh, but able to figure out that lip ball, I think, is actually going to put uh, a bit of realism into everybody's call and actually throw everybody over the edge um, when it comes to calling that big bull in. That's with the, the little big horn call. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I know when it came out out of the market, you know, everybody started um, looking at it, thought, what the heck is this thing I'm blowing through? It's the, it's got to be one of the most unique calls um, that I've ever seen. I don't know if some would have used that call or, or, or used that terminology or used some other terminology, uh, but you can actually see what this call is capable of. Uh, the call is actually designed uh, with built-in vortices um, within the call to give it that more guttural. Um, and when blowing through Dan's external call, I actually like the sound that comes out of this versus the um, original baseball bat. So I like to do a little bit of experimenting, kind of like Dan does. I, I just if I see something, I got to tear it apart. I got to see how it works. Uh, I got to put my twist on it and and make it so, you know, I'm confident going into the Elkwoods. But I just figured I would uh, um, open up my, my ba old baseball bat after 20 years. I can't believe I, I took a jigsaw to it, but I did, because um, I was really interested to see what Dan's call sounded like in it. So you can see, um, you know, there's there's a lot of similarities. I kind of like the subtleness of this one and actually the ability to put it in your pack. I mean, when you're walking through the bushes and the trees and stuff, I'm sure you've carried a, a bat or two in your time um, in the backcountry, and you're, you know, you're hitting stuff, and it's making this noise. Oh, yeah. I don't mind making noise in the woods as long as it's natural, it's clunking, it's, uh, you know, stepping on sticks and stuff. But I don't like the sound of, like, nylon or... Or plastic bumping or some, something that's unnatural. Um, elk make a lot of noise, so I don't mind making noise just as long as it sounds natural. Uh, so Dan Dan came out, a uh, little bighorn, uh, I believe it's the same tower, right Dan? Yes. Uh, so it goes into the Tormentor call. Uh, the Tormentor actually has this really nice flexible um, outer sheath on it that flexes with the call so you don't have a lot of that bulk around. A uh, really nice tube. Um, this is actually interesting. Um, the lanyard on it uh, is expandable. Uh, so you catch on the bushes and stuff like that. Or you go to put it over your shoulder with a pack. Um, it's a lot easier. It has a little bit more subtle sound um, than the little bighorn. So it depends on what you want to look for um, in a call and what your desired sound is. Um, I'll go ahead and blow on this one. So you're seeing it, it doesn't have quite the vortices or the pushback in the air, but it still does have a very distinct sound to it, really nice. Um, in a situation, I think, um, that's more up close, I think as the bull comes in closer, I think it would be better to have that subtle sound more than the blasting of the plastic and, and the really ambitious sound. Oh, yeah. um, so I think there's a really good combination. So I think in my arsenal this year, the things that I'm really going to look for um, I think if I really want to reach out there super far, I'll go with the diaphragm and the bat because it really carries out. Um, I think in your normal hunting ranges, um, I'll look more towards like the little bighorn and you can swap the towers out between these, which is really nice so you can carry both of these products with you. Um, so you can reach out a little bit more with this one and I think in the close work what I'll do is I'll move in uh, more to this call so it's a little bit more subtle. If the bull's in like at 100 yards or so, 
um, or closer. I don't want to really blast out super loud. Um, so I think that's kind of my idea this year. Uh, probably locating with like the bat. Um, Mid-range, I think I'll go with the, the little bighorn. And then as we get into the close work, I think I'll go more with the tormentor. But um, this tower is unbelievable. Um, the sounds and the guttural that comes out of this external call oh, yeah. is unlike any that I've seen or heard on the market. So, oh, yeah. And I just picked this up yesterday. Oh, yeah. It's like you were saying earlier, you know, the plastic versus, I mean, this, this doesn't make as much noise as that, yeah. that bat will. And it's a very durable material. These things are going to last you a lifetime. They're not going to, like a lot of the other bugles that are plastic, when you bend them, they're going to break. Oh, yeah. But that's what the other manufacturers want you to do. They want you to come buy a new one. Because when you buy one like this, it's going to last you your lifetime. I mean, you can't go wrong. I mean, oh, yeah. Form, function, uh, fit and trim. Uh, it's, it's just the perfect size. It's a great call. I like this one, the way it wraps around your body, um, you know, real close. Um, if you're going to do a lot of walking, um, it's like it's not even there. Oh, yeah. Um, if you're a person that has trouble with a diaphragm in your mouth, um, this external is definitely the way to go. You can get all the same sounds and and everything you want to out of it. So um, Dan offers a lot of different product lines and different scenarios. So that's what's really nice about Sawtooth Outdoors um, is the variety that Dan provides, yeah. you know, depending on, you know, your type of hunting um, and what you want to do. Oh, yeah. And what a lot of people don't know is that Dan Sawtooth Outdoor Products has the patent on the Bugle. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand that Dan Addy invented the Bugle and the other companies are just using his patent. Yeah, so kudos to you, Dan, yeah. and your experience. And uh, we've definitely learned a lot from you and we've benefited from you um, off your products and your passion for elk hunting. So thank you. And, it, and it's not just elk calls that Dan does. I mean, he's into a multitude of things. Here is the new... A2 100 grain single bevel chisel tip point that blows through heartwood. Uh, we did that video earlier, but these things are incredible. And uh, the other nice thing about them is that once you shoot them into the target when you're getting ready for to go hunting, you can resharpen them. You don't have to go buy new blades for $25 to put in your other broadheads. The beauty of these, you know, it's fantastic. That chisel tip, very important. It's not what I consider a dart tip. In broadheads, there's broadhead physics. And if you know what a plumb bob, plumb bob is, it's an engineering tool. It looks like a top that is solid steel. You take that plumb blob, bob and you're going to put it into a round of wood and try to split it. What's going to happen? It's only going to absorb into that wood. That's you right. cannot split that round of wood. Mm -hmm. Now you take a wedge and you put on that round of wood, hit it with half the power you just hit that plumb bob with, and it's going to split. Why? Because it's designed, a wedge design. So when you look at these broadheads, it's a wedge design which is going to split bone. My biggest thing that I try to educate people on is... The broadhead. It's not just the broadhead. It's the the person that's shooting. You got to pick the right broadheads for what you're you're hunting with. Um, the other broadheads with the little rounded tip on them. That's only going to absorb absorb into any bone. People need to start practicing for the worst or the best or for the worst case scenario. I'm sorry. Instead of always looking for the best case scenario. Yeah, we, I can go stand at a range at 20 yards and I can drill bullseyes and robin hoods all day long. But you get out into the field, into an environment, everything changes out there. So, practice. Get your gear to where it's going to penetrate bone. Just in case. We've all done it. I've always had great shots at 40 yards, but hey, that animal took a step and I caught it in the shoulder. With the old bear broadheads, which is on the same 
principle is this, you know, the A2, I blew through two shoulder blades on a bull at 30 yards because it has the penetration power. So think about that. What kind of tip is on your broadhead? Is it going to act like a plumb bob or is it going to act like a wood, you know, wood uh, wedge, splitting wood? Take that into consideration. It's very important. Don't get sucked into these big marketing hype. You know, hey, this is the best broadhead. But you know what? They all fail. I've had none of these fail that I've shot so far. So he's not just in bugles. He's in broadheads. He's got the peepit sights that are a serveless uh, uh, sight. It goes on your string. Once you get that thing laced in, it's not going to move on you. You're not going to have to worry about your serving coming undone. There's no serving to worry about. Then he's got the anchor knot. All this stuff, Sawtooth Outdoor Products. Go check out their website, www.sawtoothoutdoorproducts.com, and see what he's got to offer. I mean, this guy's almost, almost an Einstein. Almost. Almost. Yeah, and this head's getting bigger. I, I would like to just tell her, by I never paid these guys a penny. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're just a bunch of guys that like to hunt and have fun, right? Exactly. Should we end this all with one good bugle? Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Nice. Right on. And the next video we're going to do in the mountains, we're going to go over some other stuff that is yep. important preseason. Till then, absolutely. Good luck, everybody. Get your going on.